Tonight, Gabrielle is discussing the many ways that foraging can improve and enrich communities. She is an enthusiastic science-based foraging education content creator focused on mycology and holistic ecosystem awareness with a special focus on sustainable harvesting. In 2021, she was selected as one of TikTok's 150 Latinx creatives. And in 2022, she was one of 10 recipients of the TikTok Latinx Creatives Grant in partnership with Macro and Unbelievable, which is a funding a foraging docu-series she'll be making over next, the next year. Gabrielle keeps busy with speaking engagements, creating entertaining educational content, and writing her book. Uh, she's also whipping up new experiments in the kitchen all the time. And soon she'll be adding even more to her plate by starting her PhD in music composition and computer technologies in the fall at the University of Virginia. Welcome. Uh, that was a really kind introduction. And uh, I just want to talk to you about some of the ways that foraging can bring you closer to your community and expand your idea of what community means uh, people but also with all of the all of the natural resources around us uh, with trees and plants and mushrooms and critters and my cat that's trying to eat my sock right now stop it I actually do have to take away from hold on get away okay so hello um my uh, main focus is typically mushrooms but uh, today I'm going to talk about a number of spring plants that you may or may not know are edible, and I guarantee that some of you already know what some of these plants are. Uh, you probably have pulled them out of your gardens thinking they're just weeds, um, or maybe you just walk past them on the way to walk the dog every single day. Um, so I might have slipped a couple mushroom pictures in, but uh, today it's going to be mostly all about plants and uh, just FYI since I am the internet's mushroom auntie all of you are now my nibblings uh, which is just a gender neutral term for niece or nephew. So before we get too deep into the fantastic spring plants that we can eat I do want to talk about a few wild plant myths that are very very pervasive within uh, the conversation about foraging. Uh, so the first one would be, if a plant has any toxic parts, it should never be eaten. Um, this is false. Many plants, like this super cute little poke plant here, have both toxic and edible parts or stages. So we always have to introduce and reintroduce the concept of nuance anytime we're talking about eating wild plants, because sometimes there are parts of a plant that are perfectly edible, while other parts are very toxic. Uh, one of my very favorite summer edibles is a plant called mayapple uh, and mayapple is this tiny little passion fruit flavored uh little friend that grows on this umbrella looking under this umbrella looking leaf that looks like a tree star from the land before time um, and every single part of that plant except for the fruit is deadly toxic but th that fruit is a really, really good edible. So we just have to think about these things and make sure that we're uh, constantly questioning the uh, the way that we're going about eating something or thinking about something as edible versus inedible. Uh, the second is that most weeds are toxic. In fact, a lot of people think that most plants are toxic. Um, but of the 400,000 known plants worldwide, about half of them are considered edible and about 20,000 are used for food regularly by people around the world. Um, in other parts of the world, uh, outside of the US, uh, there are many more plants that you will find regularly eaten for food. Um, but here in the US, we mostly stick to a pretty small number. So how many different plant species do you think the average American eats? And you can throw these in the chat. I'm very curious what all of you think. How many different plant species? Kim, you might have to tell me what people think. So we have uh, 17, 10, 20, not enough, 40, 30, 20 question mark, 
So a lot okay. of good guesses here. <laughs> All right. A lot of good guesses in like the uh, 20 to 40 range. Uh, and you're all like pretty close. The average American consumes 30 species of plant regularly. Um, and over half of the plant calories that we consume come from only three sources, wheat, corn, and rice. So another plant myth. Uh, the plants growing wild in my, in my neighborhood are probably too contaminated to eat. Uh, when you think about wild plants, does the topic of pollution come up in your minds? Um, I know that for me, when I was a baby forager, it definitely did because I was terrified of eating something that had uh, pesticides on it and was going to great lengths to try to avoid eating things that might hurt me. But the research actually shows that cities are a lot more highly regulated regarding environmental contaminants than a lot of rural sites. So it might be safer to forage in your city than it would be to forage near a commercial farm. Um, so you do have to be aware of pollution or chemical use, um, especially if you are foraging in areas where um, they are using herbicides to get rid of invasive plants, um, areas where they are um, spraying for mosquitoes, uh, stuff like that. But typically foraging in cities is considered pretty safe. Uh, and if you are interested in uh, reading some of that research, there is a Civil Eats article that breaks down some of the uh, research that has been done on this topic. Um, there is a really cool study done in Boston about um, wild apples and comparing them uh, to their grocery store counterparts. And they found that there wasn't really much of a difference in how contaminated they were with heavy metals but there was a difference in how nutrient dense they were. And the wild apples foraged locally were far more nutrient dense than their grocery store counterparts because they were fresher and uh, they, had been, they had not been sitting in a warehouse for a year or more. So um, if it's safe for me, it's safe for my dog or cat as well. This is kind of a sad one. There is a group that I'm part of on Facebook called the um, Plant and Mushroom Poisons Group. And our job on that Facebook group is to identify things that people or their pets have eaten. And too often this time of year, um, we see people who have bouquets of lilies and their cats have gotten into it. Um, so just like chocolate is okay for people, but it's really toxic to dogs, some wild plants that are okay for us are super, super toxic to animals like these daylilies. Uh, daylilies are super toxic cats. And uh, in the case of daylilies, coming in contact even just with pollen from any sort of lily uh, can cause a really severe reaction or can even kill an animal. I used to work in a vet clinic. I was a uh, vet clinic manager for about three years, and I worked in surgical care before that. And it was very, very sad anytime we had to deal with a situation where an animal had come in contact with a plant that was very preventable. So even if something's edible for you, if it's something that's toxic for your animals, just make sure that you have it away from them. Um, right now, I just went out and foraged ramps uh, all out. Alliums are very toxic to cats, so I made sure to put them out of reach of my cat who tries to eat my socks. So another one, if I saw an animal or an insect eating it, then it must be safe for me to eat too. Um, I had to get some mushroom pictures in here. There's this little slug over here who's very happy to be eating this mushroom and this little squirrel over here that's hanging out with this other mushroom. <laughs> Please don't do that though. Uh, I, have, uh, I have seen some weird stuff in my day, but we are very different from other animals. We are sensitive to compounds that they have adapted to. I have literally seen slugs eating destroying angel mushrooms, which will cause DNA deletion in humans and kill you over the course of two weeks or so. Um, we are very different from a slug and we are still very different from a squirrel, even though they are very cute. Um, so just be aware of that. There are no identifications, no shortcuts in identification. We have to make sure that no matter what, if you're going to put something in your mouth, you need to make sure you know what it is. Um, I like to use a few different sources to confirm an ID before I will go ahead and eat something. 
And typically I observe what's called the three times rule. I think I coined that, I don't know if I did, but the three times rule states that you should be able to find and identify something three times out in the wild before you will put it in your body. It's a good way to keep yourself safe, to make sure that you recognize how frequently it's occurring in the landscape so you can decide whether to eat it or not, um, and to just make sure that you are keeping yourself accountable for uh, your own safety. So with no further ado, let's meet some plants. So we're gonna start with alliums. Uh, alliums are some of the easiest plants to identify and they are most prominent right now. You can tell that a plant is an allium because it will have a bulb and it will smell like onion or garlic. Uh, um, and again, alliums are edibles to cubicles of some alliums here that I'm gonna go through. The first one is Allium trichocum or ramps. Uh, these are a very, very popular plant. Um, they are uh, very highly prized by restaurateurs. They are sometimes called wild leeks. They are all also a slow growing spring ephemeral. So they're only out for a short period of time and they take a long time to grow. There is a lot of debate about foraging ramps, but in general, the advice is to avoid harvesting the bulbs, this part right down here. Um, or if you do, to only harvest them towards the center of a big patch where they are likely to be more crowded. So what I do as a forager is only collect for, uh, leaves from plants that have three leaves uh, and just remove one leaf from each of those plants with three leaves. The biggest issues uh, surrounding sustainable harvest of ramps uh, are uh, mostly just commercial foraging and deforestation. So places that uh, like restaurants that want huge orders of ramps and just send people out into the woods with a shovel and a bucket, they are typically not uh, thinking too hard about sustainable foraging. Um, and then of course, there are many areas, even here in Michigan, where um, the landscape is under threat because people want to develop it. People want to um, put in banks and apartment buildings and other things without really caring as much about the ecology as they should or without coming up with alternative ways to preserve some of these plants. Um, ramps are still prolific here in the Midwest, but we've seen their numbers decline over on the East Coast. So it is something to care about. Um, so just make sure that when you harvest ramps that you harvest them responsibly. Um, they, if you want to find them, they grow clumped together in forests with mature trees. Um, they like soil that is not compacted it's moist and well-drained, um, you're going to have better luck on a slope than you will on a flat open forest. Um, and the leaves will smell very strongly of onion or garlic. This is true of all alliums and part of why they are so easy to identify. Um, your nose is a very useful tool when you are looking for anything in the onion family. Um, if it does not smell like onion or garlic, it is not an allium. Um, and if it smells like onion or garlic, it is edible. Uh, um, they appear before the tree canopy comes in and then the leaves die back shortly after. But this one, we don't have to worry so much about when it comes to conservation. This is field garlic, Allium venali, also sometimes called crow garlic or um, onion grass. And it's an invasive allium, it originally uh, it comes from Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. It's very garlicky, kind of a uh, um, kind of a slightly more complex flavor than ramps, but some people don't like it as much. I did a blind taste test with my partner like two years ago. Uh, I made identical pestos just using different alliums, and this was his favorite one. So you might like it more than you would think, but. Um, it will look like grass to the untrained eye. Kids are really good at finding it because it loves a lawn. 
Um, and they have a lot of fun trying to dig up the bulbs. For a lot of kids, this is going to be the first edible plant that they encounter because kids love to pick things up. And this is pretty and looks like grass. Um, again, it's invasive, so you can collect as much of it as you want. You don't have to worry about sustainability practices as far as this plant goes. You do just need to be mindful of the environment in which you're collecting it so that plants that do belong in the environment aren't getting trampled along the way. Makes a really good pesto. You can dry and powder these parts right here, the top part, and they're really great for popcorn, dips, spreads. Uh, you can add them to other types of seasonings. Um, they're quite tasty. Um, so now let's briefly, oops, let's talk about mustards. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, got a pickle in my throat. <coughs> so wild mustards, they're all edible, they're mostly invasive, and they're e easy to recognize. Brassicas are selected in grocery stores for various traits. So cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and cauliflower are all actually the same species with different traits that they've been selected for. They're all Brassica oleracea. Um, wild mustards are all edible, but some are more edible than others. This is something that rings true through a lot of foraging. Um, a lot of mustards can be a little bit difficult on the palate or need to be mixed with something else in order to bring out their good qualities. Um, but there are a few in here that are super tasty with no, with no real alterations. The first one is hairy bittercress, a uh, cardamine hirsuta. Hairy bittercress is one of the very first things that I typically find in the winter. I think that this year I found my first hairy bittercress in February and it was like under the snow. So she is sturdy. Um, it can be found really early. Uh, it thrives in landscaping. It has kind of like a peppery flavor to it. Um, it makes a very good microgreen. It's invasive, but it's not invasive on the same level as some other mustards are. Um, so it grows in this cute little rosette pattern. It has these little white flowers. And when it gets a little bit taller, it develops these little seed pods. And those seed pods explode, which is very fun, but which also spread seeds. So just be careful where you're doing that. Maybe do it over some concrete. Dame's Rocket. You've probably seen this plant. It is super pretty and super invasive. Um, creates this very dense understory in forests. It really likes oak savanna and will take over oak savanna. Um, but it's this beautiful purple color. And those purple flowers you can actually use to make soda. I know, it's crazy. You can just take those flowers, add a little bit of active apple cider vinegar, some water, some sugar, and a little bit of lemon juice to a jar and cover it with a paper towel. And like a couple days later, it'll get a little fizzy and fermenty and it turns that same color, but in the liquid. It's amazing. So since it's invasive, go nuts with it. The greens are also very good, but the flowers are really kind of the star of the show here. Um, you'll find it in meadows, disturbed woodlands, and in urban areas. It loves a disturbed edge, so you will probably find it on all, all of your walking trails from here until forever. Garlic mustard. Uh, if, you are gar if you're a gardener or if you are a uh, naturalist of any type, you probably really hate Alaria petiolata. You may know that it is edible. Um, it is super prolific. It has this alle allelopathic tendency. Um, allelopathic tendencies are um, to inhibit the growth of other plants and fungi. So it releases these chemicals into the soil that make it really hard for other plants to grow nearby, um, which is why it so readily takes over in uh, in our forested environments. Uh, it was it's in, it's invasive, so it didn't evolve here and other plants didn't evolve with it to protect themselves. So you will see it just absolutely decimating forest, uh, forest wildlife. I've seen it rip through forests like nothing else. Um, it is very tasty and it's also pretty easy 
to identify. Later on in the year, it has these little white flowers. You might even be seeing them start to open up now. Um, and if you don't have the ability to grab the whole plant while you're out walking, one thing you can do to stop it from spreading is to remove the flower heads so that it can't produce seeds or seed pods. Um, it's spicy, it's garlicky, it's probably the best mustard that we have here in the Midwest. Um, if you can't get to all of it, the seeds kind of, uh, you can be used to make a really good like stone ground mustard. Um, and the roots taste like horseradish. And if you wanna be sure that what you have is actually garlic mustard, you can snap off the base and it'll be this really beautiful purple inside. Uh, this is yellow rocket, Barbaria vulgaris. Um, vulgaris, anytime you see that in Latin, just means it's a weed. It doesn't mean it's vulgar. Uh, this species is uh, another one of these really early mustards. Um, it grows in this little rosette pattern. It has these super cute little leaves. Um, the pesto is so spicy, like if you make pesto with it, that it can almost numb your mouth. So I think it works really well in like a honey mustard situation. Um, it's invasive, but it is not as invasive as some of the other mustards. You can uh, just snip the flowers off before they go to seed if you want to control its spread. Another good thing to know that you're going to find in a lot of landscaping is going to be mints. Mints are another plant. It's really easy to identify this plant family because they have square stems and opposite fragrant leaves. Um, some mints are better than other mints, but here are a few of our particularly excellent mints. Um, and just to note that all mints are edible, but not every plant with a square stem is a mint. Um, you've got to do that sniff test and make sure that you pay attention to the leaves. They should be opposite one another on the stem. This is a favorite of pollinators, uh, specifically native pollinators. This is Monarda or wild bergamot, uh, also sometimes called bee balm. It's very summery. It tastes kind of like mint, but also like thyme. Um, last year, I collected the flowers and dried and powdered them and rolled them in chocolate truffles. And it was very, very fancy. Um, and it cost me zero dollars. The whole plant is a really good tea. Um, and you will see all the pollinators just hanging out on it, uh, chilling. So if this is, uh, if you want to like do a pollinator garden, you have to make sure you include wild bergamot. Cat mint. Um, I call this the TJ Maxx plant because I find it growing outside of every strip mall ever and its populations are usually very poorly managed. This is Napita. Um, it has very pretty purple flowers which is why it's planted in landscaping but cat mint is also very good for an upset tummy and it tastes good so win-win. A win is a win. Um, really good when added to ginger. This is downy woodman. You might notice that it looks very similar to Monarda, but it has these little tears. Um, it is sometimes called pagoda mint. Uh, it is one of my favorites flavor wise. It has a little bit of a sharp peppery kind of finish. Um, and it also spreads and grows very quickly. So within a couple of years, you can have a very healthy patch of it. Um, flavor wise, uh, just really nice in something a little bit more complex like a cocktail. Um, and I find it pretty often in open hardwood forests and meadows. Uh, another spring favorite is conifers. Uh, now, a lot of people don't realize that conifers are edible, but the vast majority of them are. Um, the ones that are not are really the exception rather than the rule. And spring is the best time to start eating your local conifers. Um, so first, let's talk about pines. Pines produce a lot of edible things, including their pitch, their tips, their pollens, and their their pollen and their needles. But I think the best part of any pine is actually going to be the immature cones. Um, so around this size is perfect for doing a few different things. Things. You can make a jam out of them called varenya. It's a Ukrainian or a Russian uh, ferment uh, syrup type of thing. You can 
uh, suspend them in a syrup and you can actually just eat pine cones, which is really tasty. My favorite thing to make is a product called Magolio, which is a fermented pine cone syrup. Uh, you just collect a bunch of the tiny little cones. You pour um, like a brown sugar or turbinado sugar or something with some molasses in it over them. Um, and you let it ferment for like six months and then you strain out the cones and it's the fanciest little syrup. You can buy it too, but it's like between 25 and $45 if you want to do that. And I don't have 25 to $45 to go buying fancy ingredients that I'm only going to use on a charcuterie board. So um, very much recommend making the free version and shocking and impressing all of your friends at your next holiday party. Spruce. So spruce tips are some of my favorite spring forageables. You can use spruce in almost exactly the same way that you can use pine. Um, they've got edible cones, needles, pitch, pollen, but they also have these really beautiful, tasty tips. Um, this is the new growth, and within a few weeks, this new growth will look exactly like the old growth. Um, you really want to try to avoid cooking them if you collect them. This is a mistake that I see frequently. Uh, if you collect them and cook them, they will turn kind of a dingy brown color, and they'll still taste all right, but they won't be great. And part of the part of what you really want to get with the spruce tips is that bright green lemony color and flavor. So there are a few things that I would recommend doing with them. Um, add them to vanilla ice cream. You can uh, chop or macerate them and add them to ice cream. Um, it's super tasty. My friend Alan Burgo has a great recipe for that on his blog foragerchef.com. Um, you can also uh, try using them to make moss cakes. Uh, you can, let's see, did I include a picture? I did. So this is a cake that my friend Betsy made and it is uh, nettle on the inside and then just spruce tips that she's ground up and plastered on the outside with buttercream underneath. Betsy is a wizard. Um, and I am not nearly as good a cook as she is, but I can tell you from experience that this cake is delicious and very easy to make. Um, so highly recommend checking that out uh, and collecting spruce tips. Another great thing about spruce tips is it's very hard to over harvest them because most of the time, if you're gonna be collecting spruce, you're not gonna be able to reach most of the tips. You're really only gonna be able to get what's around the base. So always be conscious of over harvesting and not taking more than you need. But in the case of spruce, you're generally, you're generally gonna be okay. Um, and also make sure that you taste a raw spruce tip before you go and collect a whole bunch because there are variations in flavor and you might find one spruce that you really like and other spruces that you don't like so much. So here are some general invasives that have particular invasive habits that I wanna turn your attention to. Uh, we've definitely already covered a few that fit into some of the predetermined categories that I had, um, but these are ones that you should really consider eating that don't have a great category. Um, eating invasives is one of the best things that you can do if you are looking to forage because it's a net positive for the environment and it's a great way to keep populations in check. Uh, a lot of invasives were brought here originally as food uh, by people who did not realize uh, what they were what they were leaving behind. Uh, and one way that we can take responsibility for them is to eat them. So the first one is dock. You've probably seen this one. It's a common roadside plant. It's in the buckwheat family. Uh, it has these curly little leaves here and these seeds that come off very easily in your hands. They feel very papery. The whole thing is edible. Um, the greens are pretty tasty once fermented. Um, you can also blanch them and use them as like a pot herb. Really good in kimchi. Um, and these little seeds here can actually be ground up 
and turned into a pretty good flour. Um, you can cut that with wheat flour um, or acorn flour, and it makes a really good dense bread. If you're somebody like me who loves like a good, thick, heavy loaf of German bread, um, dock is really, really excellent for adding some heft. Um, plus, it is pure fiber. So if you have other sorts of needs that might necessitate eating more fiber, dock's a really good way to get some fiber in your diet. This is Japanese knotweed, um, and it is a scourge on the earth, <laughs> at least here in the U.S., um, because it reproduces rapidly and it is very, very strong. Um, so it re re reproduces by rhizome, which are these runners underneath the ground. It reproduces by cutting and by seed. Even if you leave a tiny little piece behind, it can sprout a new plant. So you have to be very, very careful. Um, if you try to buy it at a plant nursery, fortunately, you won't be able to because it is banned in most cities due to its habit of destroying building foundations. Um, in fact, it is such a big problem in the UK that if you have Japanese knotweed on your property, um, your home value will tank. So if you have it growing anywhere near a structure, it is of the utmost importance that you remove it because it will just eat right through your buildings. It does not matter. Um, it is another buckwheat family member, but it is edible. And these little shoots right here, these asparagus looking things, um, they actually taste like rhubarb. So I like using them in like a strawberry rhubarb situation. Um, I've made like a strawberry knotweed pie and bars. Um, I've made uh, knotweed sorbet. Um, it has that sort of lemony sourness that's really pleasant in a lot of desserts and a lot of palate cleansers, um, makes a great jam. And if you have it growing near you, one thing I will say is that this plant is often subject to chemical control. So typically the chemicals that need to be used in order to get rid of it um, are chemicals where they have to post something stating that those chemicals have been used. Um, so just be very aware. If you see a lot of really dead stuff growing around living plants, uh, do not harvest those for food because there is a good chance that they have been sprayed with very harmful chemicals. Uh, kudzu. Now, this is more something that is a big problem a little bit down south, but it is still making its way north. You can find it in Indiana and Illinois, and with climate change, we are sure to see it creeping up towards Michigan. Um, kudzu is edible, and that is a very good thing. I don't know that we can out eat it because it will grow sometimes multiple feet per day. But kudzu flowers are really tasty. Um, they're very fragrant, very light, kind of a mix between like violets and wisteria. Um, the leaves are very tasty as a pot herb. They're a little bit mucilaginous, so they're very good for thickening things. Um, do not eat the seeds or the seed pods, uh, but don't leave them behind either. If you do pick kudzu, um, make sure that you walk around with like a trash bag so that you can dispose of seeds and seed pods in a closed composting system as opposed to dropping them on the forest floor and continuing the spread. This little friend is mugwort. And I'm gonna show you two pictures of mugwort because um, one of them is gonna be really helpful for identifying. So this time of year mugwort is very low on the ground. You're gonna find it in fields, you're going to find it in lawns. Um, it is very famous among herbalists because supposedly it will give you weirdo dreams. I have never experienced this, but supposedly some of my friends have, and they're mostly friends that I would believe. Um, it's very good as sort of an alternative to sage. Um, if you want to burn something that smells nice in your house, mugwort is a really good option. Uh, makes a really nice tea or blended with other teas. Mugwort and lavender is like ugh, match made in heaven. 
Um, I will use it to season root vegetables, similar to how you would use like sage or parsley. Um, in particular, a friend of mine gave me a recipe for mugwort roasted potatoes that is absolutely ridiculous. Now, in order to show you how to properly identify them, I do have to show you, this is the front of the mugwort leaf. And then this is the back. You wanna see that silvery underside and it should have a very strong sagey smell. Um, it loves an abandoned area, it loves disturbance, um, and it is invasive. Later on in the year, it will get taller. So um, just keep in mind that it's going to change how it looks throughout the season. But mugwort is a very good plant to know um, and more than likely is growing within 100 yards of your house. And these are pot herbs. Pot herbs is a term that I learned from my friend Sam Thayer, who is the author of many wonderful foraging books here in the Midwest. Um, but he uses this term to describe green plants grown for culinary use. Um, you can use them to add bulk to a salad, a soup, any other dish that has a lot of greens in it. So I'm going to show you a few of my favorites, but a lot of plants, including some of the ones that I've already talked about, are going to work really well as pot herbs, um, especially as you get a little bit closer to summer. Um, the first one is nettles. Um, these are uh, these are a type of nettle, urticaceae. Um, we have two different types here in uh, North America. The first one is wood nettle, which is the friend that we see over here, um, and we have singing nettle. Um, now it sounds like wood nettle would be the chill one and stinging nettle would be the ouchy one. Um, if it looks like a friend and hurts like hell, it's wood nettle. And if it looks like it wants to hurt you, but only hurts a little bit, it's stinging nettle. Um, if you're walking in the middle of the woods and you run into nettle, there's a decent chance it's going to be wood nettle. It's taller, the leaves are bigger, um, and the best identifier is pain. Um, so when you dry them, fortunately, the little hairs that cause involuntary human swearing will go away uh, and the plant will be delicious. Um, you can also do a few other things to get rid of those little hairs. You can crush them. Um, so you can use your hands with gloves and just like rub them to make the little hairs fall off. Um, I have found that it finds a way to hurt me anyway. Um, so if I'm going to be in tears, uh, why would I not find a better way to deal with the pain? Um, I also really like the blanching method. So you just put them in boiling salted water for like two minutes and then move them over to an ice bath. No more hairs, you're done. Um, and drying them also removes those little hairs. Um, and part of why I like drying as a method is that I can handle a lot of them at once. And I really like adding dried nettle to my smoothies. Um, and it also makes a very good matcha dupe. Um, really good in baked goods, really good in um, a lot of different applications. Nettle soup and nettle pasta are two mainstays of the forager community. We love them all. Um, it seems like the sort of thing that foragers would do, um, gravitate towards a plant that wants to hurt us. Another one that I recommend is something called Sochan. Um, Sochan is just finally getting her flowers here in the foraging community, but Sochan is a plant that is very, very important uh, to Cherokee people. Um, you've probably seen the flowers. Uh, it's called cut leaf cone flower or gray cone flower. It has these really beautiful flowers uh, later on in the year that kind of look like echinacea because they are in the same family. But the early greens are super, super tasty. Um, they are also in the buckwheat. Uh, they're, uh, they are members of the larger buckwheat family and they really like growing in meadows, disturbed soil. Um, you can harvest them multiple times a year and they will keep coming back. Um, they are native plants that are really good to have around for pollinators. And uh, they are some of my favorite things to pick 
Um, they're also pretty good as salad greens, but you have to catch them early because later on in the season, they get that kind of rough feeling in your mouth, um, like you're chewing on sandpaper. So you do have to get them early. And if you're going to get them later, then you want to boil them pretty, uh, pretty intensely to make sure that you don't get sandpaper mouth. This is mallow. Mallow grows everywhere. Um, I find mallow growing on uh, fence lines pretty frequently, um, anywhere where there is an untreated, neglected lawn. Mallow likes places that have been neglected. Um, it's a relative of marshmallow. Uh, common or dwarf mallow is another name for it. Um, it's pretty mucilaginous, thick in soups and stews, um, and really just doesn't taste like anything distinctive which means if you wanna add bulk to something, if you wanna stretch a salad, if you wanna stretch a soup, mallow is a really good way to do that. Later on in the season, it produces these fun, funny little wheels. They're like that big um, and they're called cheeses. I don't think they taste like cheese, but maybe they'll look like wheels of cheese. I don't know. The people who name things all deserve to go to jail. Um, this is very much a thing for the right now. Uh, these are spring tree blossoms. I have been obsessed with tree blossoms for the past month. Uh, everything is finally starting to produce and I'm very excited about it. Um, a lot of things that are commonly planted as landscape plants are really good edibles and you're going to be surprised at how frequently you see them when you go through your neighborhood. The first one being magnolia. Um, I just made a recipe for, uh, it was magnolia tiramisu, where instead of making coffee, I dipped the lady fingers in magnolia tea. Uh, magnolia tastes kind of like ginger, like pretty remarkably like ginger actually. Um, and so you can make a really good ginger snap. You can make pink sugar by blending them um, with sugar and letting that dry. Um, you can make a uh, spicy gingery soda with them by doing exactly what I recommended with the Dame's Rocket earlier. Um, you can, actually, I don't know if I have them right around me. I don't, but um, I just had taken out some fermented magnolia buds, the unopened buds earlier uh, to make myself a little cup of tea because I was having a little bit of a, an upset tummy. So one of my favorite things. Lilacs are also edible. You can eat all the lilacs and they smell amazing. The hard thing is keeping that smell from going away because it's very fleeting. It's also why you don't see a lot of lilac scented perfumes, um, at least ones that actually smell like lilac uh, because it's really, really hard to, um, to trap that scent. You can trap it for a little while though, uh, if you use a fat, something like butter or cream. Um, in your case, you could definitely use a plant butter. It works just as well. Um, I made a plant butter icing last year uh, and it was very, very good and it worked super well. Um, and you can also infuse them in um, some kind of a honey or agave. You can blend them with sugar um, and lilacs come in a lot of different colors. So you can select for color when you pick your lilacs uh, to decide what color sugar you want. So it's pretty fun. Red butter out right now. Um, they are very distinctive trees and you'll often know what they are by looking at them from far away because they're super, super bright, like red purple color. Uh, they're gorgeous trees. They smell amazing and they're actually legumes. They are members of the bean family. So those flowers, these little guys right here can be eaten in a beanie sort of way. You can also eat the little beans that uh, occur on the tree a little bit later in the year when they're still green. And you can make like a naturally pink lemonade with them. You can toss them in a taco, um, very good in a salad. Um, and if you want to make sure that what you have is actually a red bud tree, you can look along the branches and along the trunk because there will be little groupings of flowers that just pop out on the trunk as opposed to just on the ends of the branches. Um, so they're a very distinctive, very important native tree. They provide a lot of food and habitat to native wildlife. So if you're looking for something to plant in your yard, highly recommend a red bud. They look pretty all year long. 
Apple. Um, apple blossoms are edible. They taste very faintly apple-y. They're super good for making tea blends because they keep that beautiful color um, even after you've dried them. Um, they're very nice in a jelly. Um, I also will collect them after I've done, after I've finished like baking something um, and I'll add them to like cakes and cookies and anything that I can stick them in icing. Uh, they're very good. Um, I tried to make boba last year, um, but I can't use tapioca because I just make a mess every single time. It was a very bad idea. I do not recommend. My friend Alexis Nicole has an excellent recipe for uh, milk tea using apple, uh, and I think she used oat milk. Uh, it looked great, and by all accounts, is very good. So I would use her recipe and not mine. So just to just to bring us all the way back around to the ground, here's a few of my favorite ground flowers that you can find in early spring. And the nice thing about these flowers is that you can eat the whole thing from flower to root. So there is no part of any of these plants that you have to worry about being toxic. Uh, the first one being dandelions. Dandelions are edible. They are super, super good for you. Um, the roots can be roasted to make a coffee-like beverage. Um, you can blanch or ferment the greens or if you really don't mind bitter things, you can try eating the greens raw. Um, I can't do it personally. I need a little something something to make them edible for me. Um, a blanche usually does just fine. Um, also very nice to add to like a kimchi or something where I've got something a little sweet or a little salty going on. Um, you can eat the flowers, you can make dandelion wine, dandelion mead, whatever you want. They're also quite good. I have some friends who recently made a vegan dandelion ice cream um, and it was bright yellow and I'm gonna have to try that. Daylilies are also an invasive edible. Um, they are edible from the tubers all the way up to the flowers. Um, so this time of year is a really good time of year to collect the tubers. Um, you can pull them up and they'll have all these little tubers hanging off the bottom, kind of like little potatoes. And they actually taste a little bit like potatoes. Um, because they're invasive, you can collect a whole bunch of them. They dry really well, so you can eat them throughout the year. Um, the flower buds make really good pickles. I also like to take the opened flowers and tempura and uh, fry them to make little fritters. Um, the shoots taste a little bit like snap peas, but uh, depending on how many you eat and what your tolerance for such things is, um, be careful eating too many raw. Um, the tubers, yeah, they're kind of like a cross between burdock and potatoes, like I've written here. I would say they skew more potato. Um, and again, don't let your pets near them. Chicory, you've probably seen this one, again, growing on roadsides. It's very common by roadsides. Uh, the flowers are a little bit astringent, but very nice in a garnish. Uh, the roots are another good coffee substitute and throughout the depression and throughout uh, World War I and World War II, they were commonly used as coffee additives or as coffee substitutes. Uh, in fact, in France, the most popular coffees typically have a blend of chicory root in them. Um, so they are quite good. Uh, I am of the opinion that if you're going to drink coffee, um, it is very difficult to find a real substitute for it. I am a caffeine junkie, but I do love having a hot beverage, a hot cup of something in my hands and chicory is a really good option. Um, the greens are a great pot herb as long as you don't get them too late. If you get them too late, then they're really kind of tough and stringy and hard to manage. Violets. We are having a banner year for violets in Michigan, by the way, so go nuts. Um, but there are many different species. Some of them smell good, some of them don't. They're all edible, it doesn't matter. Um, you should make sure that they have this little butterfly shape to them. I have seen some people uh, confuse other low growing purple flowers for violets. Um, a few tells are going to be the butterfly shaped flowers and the heart shaped leaves with the slightly serrated edges. As long as you've got those things in place, you have violets. Um, I find a lot of viola odorata, which is the nice smelling violet. Again, 
in Latin, if you see the, uh, the word odorata pop up, it means it smells good. It doesn't mean it smells bad, which I think is weird, but Latin is weird. And the people who name plants all deserve to go to jail. So um, the cool thing about violets is that they are pH indicators. You can use them to make color changing syrups. Um, they have a lot of anthocyanins, uh, which are the purple making chemicals. And you can alter uh, the color by either adding an acid or adding a base. So if you add a base to your violet syrup, it will turn green. And if you add an acid, it will turn pink. Um, you do have to make sure that you are using distilled or filtered water to make your violet syrup in the first place, or you will end up with a weird range of colors because city water is usually not a perfect neutral on the pH scale. The leaves are also very tasty. They are an underappreciated vegetable. They are super delicious on their own. If I'm going to pick anything to go in like a light spring salad, it's probably going to be violet leaves. Um, I also have made like violet soups that are very good and very similar to a nettle soup, just bright green, full of, full of flavor. So congratulations, you have just potentially doubled the number of distinct plants that you can add to your diet. And you probably already knew a lot of them because you've probably pulled them out of your gardens or you've walked past them and wondered, I wonder what that flower is. Um, or you have used them to gauge the changing of the seasons. Um, so there are a lot more that I don't even have time to cover, but you're already off to a very good start. So now, as the bearer of very important food knowledge, you are invited into a relationship, a very important relationship, one that humans cultivate with the natural world. Um, and it is a relationship that we hope is based in reciprocity, uh, which means that you are both taking and giving as part of that relationship. And when you pick wild food, you are an active part of nature's community. So what that means is that we wanna make sure that we're only taking what we need and what we can use, um, that we're making those choices about what to pick and when to pick based on what is best, not just for us and for what we want, um, but for the environment at large. Um, it also means that we get to take some responsibility for restoring and protecting the land, uh, restoring and protecting the land, the waters, and uh, everything that occupies them. Um, it also means that we have to recognize and dismantle systems of colonization and white supremacy that have uh, been the norm here in North America for years and years. Um, and it means that we need to start healing that relationship. We need to heal our relationship with nature, but we also need to heal our relationships with one another. So I want to make sure that I don't just leave you with a bunch of things that you can positively identify. I wanna leave you with something, um, a mindset to take forward with you. Um, and it's the honorable harvest. So this lovely woman right here is Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. She is a member of the Potawatomi Nation and she wrote a beautiful book called Braiding Sweetgrass um, that I highly recommend reading if you're somebody who wants to explore what it means to be a partner with nature. Um, so the Honorable Harvest is a series of guidelines that are generally, um, although it's not specific, uh, they're generally followed by most indigenous people in North America and have been for uh, thousands of years. Um, and it's something that indigenous people have chosen to share with the rest of us to allow us to behave in a more thoughtful manner when we are interacting with nature. Um, it's really important that we recognize that plants, just like us, are beings unto themselves and they deserve respect. They deserve deference, just like we would show to one another um, or to an animal. And when we are interacting with each other, we rely on systems of consent. Um, if I want something from you, I'm going to ask your permission before just barging into your house and taking it. Um, so it's really important to remember that we have to keep that balance of nature by 
showing restraint, uh, not being greedy or selfish, asking permission. So um, these are just a few of her guidelines that I think are really important to reiterate here. Um, the first is to never take the first or the last one you find in case it's the last one. Um, ask permission and abide by the answer. Uh, this is the one that kind of gets people sometimes, um, the idea that you should ask permission of uh, an organism that can't talk back to you. But part of asking permission is taking that moment to pause and to really think about whether this is something you need, uh, to think about the impacts that taking will have on the environment or on the organism, um, if there are other organisms that need it more than you do, um, and how much would be permissible to take, you know? And sometimes there are obvious barriers, like if there's a bunch of poison ivy covering up all those berries that you wanna pick, that's probably a no. But, um, you know, if something is abundant and uh, there are lots of different animals out there enjoying it, um, or it's a particularly good year for acorns, that's probably a yes. Um, harvest respectfully. Make sure that you're paying attention to where you're walking so you're not stepping on other plants. Make sure that you are um, being mindful of um, animals' homes, being mindful of habitat uh, when you are harvesting so that you're not doing damage in the process. And that when you are actually physically harvesting, uh, that you are doing so in a way that minimizes damage to the overall organism. Use everything you take. Um, this does get a little bit hairy with invasives because you know I probably harvest something like 20 bags of garlic mustard every year, but I'm not going to eat all that garlic mustard. Um, but when it comes to collecting native plants uh, or things that are not abundant for food, um, always make sure that you are using every last bit of that resource or that you are providing it as a gift to someone who needs it. Be grateful. Being grateful is a practice. It is not just uh, something that happens in a moment. Um, you can be grateful for what you take uh, by physically uh, saying thank you um, or by just meditating on feelings of gratefulness and um, throughout the process of collecting, bringing that food home, um, cooking it and eating it. Um, offer something in return. Um, so indigenous people in on Turtle Island will typically offer tobacco as um, a gift for the plants in exchange for what they are removing. Um, if you are not indigenous, perhaps you can pick up some trash in the area. Um, perhaps you can pull some invasive plants or plant some native seeds. Um, leave some for others. Uh, others are not necessarily people. Sometimes they are animals. Um, sometimes they're other people. Um, but that is part of not taking everything that's there. Um, I have seen a lot of instances where, you know, somebody comes through and cuts all the chicken of the woods right off of the tree. And maybe they needed it. I hope they did. But if they didn't, then um, it makes me kind of sad to think about all of the other creatures that could have benefited from that food um, that have to now go get it elsewhere. And we've encroached so much on um, animals territory and uh, so much on uh, indigenous people that we wanna make sure that we're being respectful and not taking everything that we see. Um, and I just want to leave you with this quote um, from Braiding Sweetgrass. It reads, we need acts of restoration, not only for polluted waters and degraded lands, but also for our relationship to the world. We need to restore honor to the way that we live so that when we walk through the world, we don't have to avert our eyes with shame so that we can hold our heads up high and receive the respectful acknowledgement of the rest of the Earth's beings. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Can cats eat cat mint? Yes, and they like it. They like it a lot. If you want to bring all the stray cats to your yard, um, you do not uh, need your milkshake. You just need cat mint. Uh, it does a really great job. I bring it home for my cats sometimes and they go crazy. They are idiots and I love them. Um, 
let's see, how can you know what plants to avoid with certain medications and or supplements? Also a great question. Um, those are really good questions for your doctor. Um, there are some resources out there that you can find. Um, I will actually pull one up for you now um, that will talk about uh, some of how plants have been used medicinally throughout history. Um, and I will drop it in the chat. Uh, here it is. It is the Native American Ethnobotany Database. Um, and that I think will be helpful to you. Um, let's see, all types of magnolia are edible. Yes, they are. They can vary in flavor and uh, in quality. I found that the two that I consistently love are going to be saucer magnolia and magnolia grandiflora, which I don't find very often here, but supposedly they do exist. Um, Grandiflora skews more clove, black tea, ginger, um, and saucer magnolias, which are very common in Michigan, have a very distinct, uh, sharp, gingery flavor. Um, what foraging and plant identification resources do you recommend? I uh, highly recommend that if you're able, you pick up any of Samuel Thayer's books. I will put his website in the chat. Um, Forager's Harvest, I believe, is what it's called. Yes, foragersharvest.com. You can find his books there. He's extremely knowledgeable. Um, and he's also just a really great guy. Uh, his books will show you from A to Z what to look at. Um, they talk about sustainability. They talk about uh, maintaining good populations of plants. And he also just, uh, just wrote a really, really fabulous field guide that I actually helped edit. So. Um, I can definitely recommend that. Um, let's see. Uh, with plants in my garden, I normally stop eating the leaf and fruit once they go to seed. Is that the same for wild plants? Typically, yes, um, only because usually the leaves are going to be too tough by the time the plant has gone to seed. Um, certain plants like poke, they need to be uh, they need to be avoided after a certain amount of time because they increase in toxins. Uh, you mentioned growing some of these things. Do you propagate to plant elsewhere, or are there seed resources available? I do both. Um, I think that part of being a good land steward is making sure that you are helping plants to spread uh, as needed. So I do this with plants and with mushrooms. Um, I assess different places where I forage and look for plants that would make the area better, that would bring something uh, useful to that environment or to the beings that live there. So I do a lot of moving plants around, um, transplanting or just planting seeds. Uh, you do have to be very careful with things that label themselves native wildflower mixes because usually they have invasive seeds in them. So. Um, when it comes to like purchasing native plants, you can purchase from uh, the DNR, uh, and often they're quite cheap. You can purchase native plants from um, nature centers who are trying to get more native plants out into the landscape. And you can also purchase from certain trusted places, like I really like Prairie Moon Nursery. You can find a ton of things uh, on their on their website. Uh, they can be a little pricey, but they are very good quality seeds. I found a bunch of trout lilies in the woods by my house. Are they also edible? Yes, with conditions. Um, trout lily leaves are edible, but they are an emetic, so they will make you vomit if you have too many of them. You want to make sure that you keep your trout lily leaf consumption to about one leaf per day. Um, you didn't mention milkweed at all. Does that have edible parts? Yes, it does. Milkweed is also edible from tip to root. Um, milkweed shoots are really good this time of year, usually in a few weeks from now. You want to get them before the leaves open down like this when they're still pointed up. That's when the shoots are best. They're one of my favorite foods. Um, I didn't mention milkweed because it tends to be contentious to talk about the edibility of milkweed. Um, milkweed is edible, but 
in uh many books written back in like the 70s through the 90s was talked about as being inedible. Um, the reason that it was talked about as being inedible is because the people who wrote those books, <coughs> Yule Gibbons, uh, accidentally misidentified milkweed. Um, they ate dog bane instead of milkweed. Uh, it's very easy to mix them up. So rather than send you out there and accidentally make a Yule Gibbons mistake, um, I would recommend that if you're going to start eating milkweed, um, start with milkweed flowers um, and observe the life cycle of milkweed before you go out there trying to find it, um, because it is actually very, very easy to mix up milkweed and dogbane if you are not experienced. Um, so start with the flowers, um, the pods, uh, the uh, unopened flower buds are also very good. Um, and then try to hit the shoots the following year when you know exactly where the plants are. Um, any other questions? And did I miss anybody? What about cattail? Yes, cattail also edible, also very good. Um, in a few weeks, cattail shoots will be up. They are a favorite of mine. Um, very, very nutrient dense, very good for you. Um, a lot of protein actually. Um, cattail are sometimes called the grocery store of the marsh or the grocery store of the bog. And uh, it's because there's always something you can eat on a cattail. Um, a few of my favorite parts of the cattail are cattail pollen. Um, which is this beautiful golden color. I collect it and I will roll truffles in it. Very fancy. Um, I also love cattail laterals, which are, are these laterally growing shoots that come out towards the end of summer. They taste kind of like cucumber. They're very, very ch like crisp, kind of like cucumber. Um, cattail shoots are great. They can be a little bit boggy, but uh, if you like that sort of thing like I do, that won't bother you. Um, and you can also collect the, uh, the male part of a cattail. So if you've ever paid close attention to cattail, they have like two little doohickeys on top. And the one up here is the male portion of the plant. And then the one down here is the female portion of the plant. Um, so they can just like pollinate each other like crazy. Um, so I like, um, snapping off that male portion before it goes to seed and roasting it. Very tasty. 